Now we're looking again this morning at Acts chapter 5 and we're going to continue our series of studies as we look at the early church and so many lessons that come out of these verses. We've come to the second half of chapter 5 and to the reading that we had this morning where we find the apostles again finding and facing opposition and persecution in the form of the wrath of the Sanhedrin. We read in verse 17, Then the high priest rose up and all that were with him. We notice here the cycles of history. The cycles of history in the book of Acts and the cycles of history that have repeated themselves again and again. Wave after wave of opposition and persecution. Now when you read in the history books at school, children, you may well be taught that the first opposition and persecution of Christians started in around AD 64 when the Emperor Nero came and he caused great persecution and he did. That's a fact of history and we shall find out more about that. But the persecution started a lot, lot earlier. We've already seen that the Sanhedrin were angry the first time and they put Peter and John in prison. And it tells us later that the apostles were secondly, a second time, put in prison. There was this battle going on. Two forces, two wills, the Sadducees who focused on the outward religion that can be worn, that can be shown with great prayers and with their teaching that led to their power being increased, their position, their status, the outward religion that they promoted. And then there was the real inner religion that was being taught by Peter and by John and the other apostles. This battle is going to go on, the outward versus the inward, the fake versus the real, the false versus the genuine. Well, we see here the healing of the lame man, which we've considered in recent weeks, and the mighty miracles, numerous miracles, with the multitudes that were gathered from the villages, these only made the Sadducees even more irate. They became so cross as they considered the threat, the threat to their position, the threat to their authority, and the teaching which cut right across what they believed. The first thing that we know about what they believed was they taught there was no resurrection. There was no resurrection of Christ and there was no resurrection after we all die. And therefore, what the apostles taught, where the resurrection was central, absolutely core to their increased boldness and the radical change that had occurred from their, when they were disciples, to now as the apostles empowered and strengthened. So these things were very challenging to the Sadducees and to their self-professed power and authority. Well, we have three headings this morning. We should look at the first two very briefly. The reaction, we've seen it before, we're going to see it again. The reaction of the enemies of the gospel. Secondly, the miraculous deliverance of Peter and John and of the other apostles, if they were with them, from the prison. And then thirdly, we shall spend a bit more time on this. Why were they delivered? They were delivered to speak, to stand and to show the truth of the gospel. So let's look first of all at the unreasonable reaction again. They laid hands, verse 18. They seized them 
they got hold of them. They sent the henchmen to find the apostles and they put them in the common prison. It's exactly the same words that were used in Acts 4, but that word common is added to it. That means it was the place where the murderers, where the criminals, the villains, the robbers were housed in the prison, the common jail, even though these men had done nothing wrong. They were not robbers. They were not villains. They were not murderers. They were just a threat to the ideology of the Sadducees. And so they're gathered up and they're put into the common prison, purely out of jealousy and envy, because the attention had switched from them, the Sadducees, the crowds now were focused on Peter and John. Their thinking was unreasonable and it was irrational. As we've said before, putting them in prison wasn't going to stop this vast movement where now thousands were convinced of the truth of God and of the power that came not only in the miracles but in the new life that was being given to one after the other as the apostles taught. And it is ever the case, isn't it? When the truth of the gospel, the real gospel, is proclaimed, there will be enemies. There will be those that threaten. They come up with new laws. They say that you can't speak in the marketplace. You can't have Bibles in your home. You can't meet together. You can't even use the internet to broadcast and proclaim. And if you do, we will threaten you. And so they were threatened. The problem <clears throat> seems to be getting worse. Their first plan, prison, failed. So they try it again. And it's going to fail the second time as well. Prison was all they could think of. Let's just round them up, put them away with the criminals. That will do the job. Well, it failed, as we consider here. The second heading, a miraculous delivery here. Verse 19, the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth. Well, Matthew Henry says, on this verse, there is no prison so dark, so strong, but God can visit his people in it. And if he pleases, fetch them out. And he did. You see, God is sovereign. We say it again and again. God has a plan. This plan was worked out before the creation of the world. He knew that men and women would fall into sin. He knew that through the history of time, society would get worse and worse. It happened before Noah, and he had to draw a line, enough, enough. And it's happening again now. And so he has a plan. And in his sovereign plan, he says, no, you will not stop my purposes. It might be that there's some natural disaster, a tsunami, a storm, a flood, a famine, and that will bring the people to their knees. That will bring down a government. That will stop the tyranny against true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it may be it needs to be some unnatural, pandemic, some disease, and God intervenes. And so he intervenes here. The angel of the Lord, some people say, looking at this verse, it was just a messenger, one of the other disciples or apostles that came. No, surely not. Because the angel of the Lord came with a message. And this message was completely different from what you would expect. It wasn't a message that said, go and hide. 
Go and wait. Go and take your ease. Go and take your comfort. No, the message, verse 20, was go, stand, and speak in the temple. You see, God has his plan. He knew that the Sadducees would come against these apostles. This was part of his plan. He knew that the persecution was going to get greater and greater and greater. And it reaches a crescendo in AD 64. And then there would be the great disbursement, great dispersion. They would be dispersed across the lands. And this would be for the purpose of God and for the gospel. Everything that's happening, everything that we read in these chapters is working out to the purposes of God's plan. The plan to take the gospel to every land and to every nation. This miraculous delivery itself is another sign. It's a sign to us that God had a plan and it was a sign even to the senators, to the Sadducees, to the chief priest, to Annas or Caiaphas, who was the chief priest at the time. And they noticed. They wondered what would happen as they heard and they were told. Verse 24, they doubted of them where unto. What will happen? There seems to be power in their hands to heal. And there's power when they're in prison to release them. And even the guards can't stop them. Power. Power that we can't resist. Power that we can't put a stop to. And even we are powerless. Verse 26. The captain with the officials went. They couldn't even use the violence that they wanted to because they feared the people. You see, God is in control. He's working all his purposes out. As age proceeds to age, as we sing, the angel comes and there's going to be a commission. Peter and John will hear the words of the angel. In one sense, it will be a new commission, but in another sense, it was exactly the same commission that the apostles had been given in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and that they were given in Mark chapter 15. Well, thirdly then, as we come to our third heading, we shall spend a bit more time on this. Delivered and commissioned again to stand, to speak and to show. A commission, let's turn to it, that's almost identical to Acts chapter 1. And verse 8, we said at the time when we looked at this, that this was the key to understanding the whole of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall after receive that the Holy Ghost. That was Pentecost. Is come upon you. And here's the key bit. Ye shall be, ye shall become witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We don't need to turn to it, but it's a bit like the Great Commission. Go <clears throat> unto all the earth and make disciples of men and be witnesses of me. You see, this is the commission. It's not changed. That's the third time. Mark. Acts 1, and now the angel who comes bearing these words. Go, go, go into all the world. Go to the temple. Go to the rest of Jerusalem, to the Jews, and then in due course go to the Gentiles. And that great apostle will be raised up, Paul, who will go and speak. And it will be his commission to speak. What were they to do? Well, they were to stand. Stand firm. Don't waver. Don't deviate. You carry on preaching about the resurrection. You carry on preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you carry on speaking a challenging, convicting message, telling the people, you, with your wicked hands, you took him, you crucified him, you slayed him. And the people knew that what they were saying was the truth, and everybody knows. You sing, there is that ring of truth. We don't have to argue and explain from first principles. We just have to declare. Go, stand, don't deviate. And thirdly, speak in the temple. Speak. And these wonderful words here. Speak. What were they to speak? Speak to the people. Stand up. In front of those colonnades, Solomon's porch, the temple behind, thousands upon thousands of people going back into the lion's den, as it were, to the place where the Sadducees felt it was their domain, back into the hottest heat, back where they would be the most provocative, back to speak the words of life which would get them hot under the collar again. The words of this life. That's a very interesting term. The words of this life. What does it mean? Well, they were to speak of new life. The new life that comes only through the Lord Jesus Christ, through this name that the Sadducees didn't want them to name. New life in Christ, not the dead religion of sacrifices and ceremonies. They now spoke of better things. They spoke of the risen Christ, the life-giving <coughs> Christ, the living Christ. They were going to speak of eternal life, of life beyond the grave, of a future life. They were going to speak again. What the Sadducees hated. Resurrection in Christ. We saw it. We witnessed it with our own eyes. Christ rose from the dead on the third day. And because he lives, so we live. And so you could live if you will trust him. Life after death. Gospel life. Isn't this what they would have spoken about? Let me remind you that the words that are recorded for us later in the chapter, it's just a summary. It tells us that the apostles, verse 29, Peter and the other apostles, this is just a summary of what they spoke in verse 29. And to verse 32, many of them would have preached. They would have preached for many hours, one after the other. One would stand up, and then another, Peter, then John, and then the other apostles. Well, what a contrast this was to what the Sadducees taught. They were the ancient secular humanists that we hear today. There is no life after death. Well, that's what we're taught today. There is no change of life and no saviour. That's what we're taught today. There is no need for revelation and truth and the authority that comes from God's word. We are the authority, they taught. We have all the understanding. We're the ones that interpret the ancient writings. We can overcome. We can derive meaning in life. That's what they taught. The problem is, what they taught has no power. It doesn't change lives. It doesn't give life after death. It makes us focused on the here and the now. It makes us focused on what people think of me. Power, authority, reputation. 
That's what the Sadducees thought most about. The secular humanism that's full of lies, full of folly, full of foolishness. What a different message. Go and speak the words of life. That's what we declare. That's not what we're hearing about today, is it? We're hearing about in the pandemic. We can overcome. We'll find the vaccine. There's many in trial. One of them will work. No, my friends. These things are just teaching us to think about your soul. To think about your never dying soul. And the fact that we need the words of life. The same words that the apostles taught. Let's look down at verse 30. These are wonderful verses. The God of our fathers. This is what they're teaching. The God that we should obey. In verse 29. The God that rose up Jesus. Gave him power for new life. And then he turns the cannon as though they should be timid. No, no timidity. Courage, courage, courage. The God that you, you can see them pointing the finger, not being rude and offensive. Perhaps they would have had their hand. You, maybe he would have turned to where the Sadducees were sitting or standing. You, you the crowd, maybe he would have looked at the people. You did it with wicked hands and you slew him. You're the murderer. You're the one that shouted, crucify him. And he was hung on the tree. It's this convicting, challenging, personal message. You, 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 and we should do that when we preach. We don't point to the individual, but the Holy Spirit comes and takes the words and convicts the heart. Him hath God exalted with his right hand, the hand of power, the hand of strength, to be a prince and to be a saviour. Well, I want in the final minutes that we have this morning. You see, this is all about verse 32. They're explaining first the message, but finally they justify themselves to a degree. You see, it's as though Peter's saying, here's our message, we'll tell you what it is about the Saviour, about the resurrection, about the fact that you did it about the fact that he is the saviour. He's the real authority, the <clears throat> prince. And he's the one that can give you the gift of repentance and forgiveness. But why do we do this, you Sadducees? We do it, verse 32, because we're his witnesses. He sent us. We didn't choose to do this. We were fishermen. We were tax collectors. Ordinary, uneducated people as you call us. And now we've been called to be his witnesses. And we would much rather obey God than man and you. So this is about how we can be faithful witnesses. I have a number of points. I can cover them very quickly. We just prove them from the verses which are in front of us. They were faithful witnesses and surely the message for us is if you are a child of God this morning, you and I, we are to be faithful witnesses. We are his witnesses, says Peter, of these things. So first of all, how can I be a faithful witness well, look, it says to us in verse 21, I go back to verse 21. A faithful witness is one that obeys 
instantly. They heard this message from the angel and when they heard it, they entered in the temple in the afternoon. No, it doesn't say that. The following day, it doesn't say that. When they'd prayed about it for two or three weeks, no. Early in the morning. Sometimes we ask people, can you do this? Could you do that? Could you come and visit in the prison? Could you teach a Sunday school class? Would you become a member of the church? Because that's what God teaches. Early in the morning. Instant obedience. Not, I'll pray about it. I'll see how I feel. We don't need to pray about what God teaches. We need to do it. We need to go straight away. They heard and they did it. If the word of God says be baptised, go and be baptised. If the word of God says go and stand and speak, go and do it. Early in the morning. Six o'clock? Sure it was. They went before any of the henchmen could get in their right place. They went before the alarm was raised. Early in the morning. And they taught. Well, secondly, we've already considered it. We can cover this briefly. What did they do? They stood for truth. They didn't go and stand for a wishy-washy gospel. One where we just play music and entertain and try and please people and make it easy for them. Oh, no. They made it difficult for the people. They stood firm. They went with an offensive message. They didn't try to be offensive, but they took the message which is offensive about the resurrection, which the Sadducees didn't want to hear. <coughs> they stood for truth. Verse 26, Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. You see, they stood, and the Lord, he protected them. They didn't worry that if they stood for truth, they might get stoned. The Lord will keep us. The Lord even used the crowd to suppress the authorities so they couldn't lay a hand upon them. Thirdly, they had a plan. They had a very, very clear plan. Verse 28, it tells us this. The Sadducees witnessed it, it says. Didn't we tell you? We gave you very strict instructions. We said, don't mention that name. Don't go out and preach. What have you done? Well, they did what they planned to do. They wanted to fill Jerusalem with their teaching. And that's exactly what they did. They filled Jerusalem with the message of new life. The message of an inner life. Of cleansing from sin. Of repentance being the only way in which we can have forgiveness. And this message, it filled Jerusalem. Tens of thousands and they would have told tens of thousands more. Was there anyone in Jerusalem that didn't know about Peter and John and their message? They filled it. My friends, if we want to be faithful, we want to fill Bedford and beyond with the message of new life. We have filled Bedford with our teaching. Well, may that be so. Wouldn't we do that? Wouldn't we use every means available to us? YouTube, 
posters, WhatsApp, text messages. I don't know what ingenious methods we can use, but it's the same method. We get the word of God out there. We let people hear the preaching. We tell them of what the Saviour did for us. We tell them, I was once this, and now I'm that. I was once a sinner. I couldn't control my sin. My besetting addiction to sin, it got the better of me all the time. But now, I don't have to do those things anymore. Sometimes I slip and fall. Look at what the Lord has done for me. That's being a witness. Fourthly, we obey God and not man. If there ever becomes a time where we're not able to function. Now, some Christians have said we should be meeting together. We shouldn't take any notice of the government. I'm afraid we don't go along with that. This is a serious pandemic. And as it teaches, we shall consider this briefly tonight, in Romans 12, we have responsibilities to obey authorities where it's something that's right, but not where the word of God is hampered and where the gospel is outlawed. A good friend of mine this week, one of our fellow pastors, he had the opportunity to preach to thousands in two Islamic countries. He was invited. Thousands heard his message in countries where it's not allowed to name the name of Christ. And in Farsi, he spoke of John chapter 4, the woman at the well, and he raised up Christ and people heard it. Well, that's what we do. We would not obey man. We would obey God where it's right to do so. Fifthly, they had courage. Oh, what courage. What boldness. We've thought about this in chapter 4. They had boldness and courage. They prayed for more. And they have it even more. Do you know when they were delivered? It would have been so easy, wouldn't it? We've been in prison once, no, twice. And this time they put us with the murderers. No, we're not having that again. We'll go and retire to a sleepy back street in Jerusalem. They won't find us there. No, they say. Let's go to the temple where we've got the maximum possibility of being arrested the third time. What courage. What boldness. They wouldn't water down the message. They spoke it as it was. They wanted to expose, open up the sin of the people. They wanted to speak to the conscience. And they wanted to lift up the cross. The offensive cross. And the resurrection. The offensive resurrection. And so, sixthly, they spoke the truth. They spoke of law and they spoke of grace. They spoke of sin and they spoke of righteousness. They spoke of a prince and they spoke of a saviour and they spoke of the only way. Repentance. The repentance that is given to Israel, to the Jews first, <clears throat> verse 31. And through repentance comes the, rep the forgiveness of sin, the only way in which we can be right with God. Verse 32, as we close, the final way in which we can be a faithful witness. You see, all those who are obedient, God hath given to them that obey him the Holy Ghost. You see, it's not given to the super gifted. It's not given to those that are Christians that have the Holy Spirit. It's given to all who come obediently in repentance and in faith 
and have the forgiveness of sin. So it says, we are witnesses. And every one that is a faithful witness and every child of God will desire to be a witness that's faithful. And so also the Holy Ghost whom God has given. These are the ways, these are the means in which we can be faithful. As Peter and John and the apostles were, they were faithful witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ. They were delivered to stand, delivered from the prison, delivered to go, to stand and to speak and to show the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the all-conquering message of the cross to all who would hear it in the temple, even though it would lead to even further problems. They did not mind because they were driven by obedience to God and not to man. Well, may the Lord help us to have that same spirit of obedience, to be faithful witnesses of these things and to speak the words of this life.